Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. Now, even though my shirt is kind of a joke, resistors obviously are very critical to the performance of electronics. And especially in vintage vacuum tube electronics, there can be some pitfalls in picking modern ones. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Let's get to it. Ah, the humble axial lead carbon composition resistor. It was the simplest building block in vintage RF electronics and they did their job for decades while rarely causing any trouble. And as long as they test reasonably well to within their marked tolerance, we leave them alone during any restoration work. But what if they don't check out reasonably well? What if they're way out of tolerance? The solution of course used to be very simple. Just replace the bad ones with new carbon comps and move on. Fast forward to today and that solution has all but evaporated because carbon composition technology was obsoleted over 20 years ago. Major manufacturers like Allen Bradley and Stackpole Electronics have long ceased making them, leaving us hobbyists to scramble between niche manufacturers and questionable new old stock. Of course, axial lead resistors are still plentiful in newer chemistries like metal film, carbon film, ceramic, and a few others. It won't be long though before those will be our only choices for restoration work, and the once ubiquitous carbon composition resistor will have gone extinct. This is a timely topic for me because I just recently completed a restoration on my Heathkit DX60. It has around 30 carbon composition resistors in it and I ended up replacing all of them. Now normally on a rig like this, I would only replace those that were maybe 10% or more out of tolerance. But in this case, I stripped this down to a bare chassis and I ended up discarding all the original resistors. And a frequent statement that you will hear in the lore about carbon composition resistors goes something like this. You can only replace a carbon comp with another carbon comp, otherwise you'll ruin your radio. Well, that's an exaggeration, but like a lot of lore and engineering, there is a bit of truth buried in all that, and that's what I'm going to explore next. The fear of ruining your radio is linked to a physical phenomenon that actually does exist. It's called parasitic reactants. Some resistors do indeed behave like inductors or capacitors at radio frequencies, even at the HF frequencies we amateur radio folks operate within. An ideal resistor would not be sensitive to the frequency of the AC voltage applied to it. Or in other words, its impedance, the sum of its resistance and reactants, would be stable. That's because the reactive component of its impedance would be zero. No capacitive reactants, no inductive reactants, just a fixed resistance. On this plot here, the x-axis is frequency, and the y-axis is the magnitude of the resistor's normalized impedance. That gives us a unitless indication of how much the impedance changes from its DC value. So a horizontal line at a value of one means the resistor is not affected by frequency. That's our ideal resistor shown by the blue line. If, however, our resistor has strong parasitic inductance, we would expect its impedance to increase with increasing frequency. And conversely, if our resistor has strong parasitic capacitance, we would expect the opposite, decreasing impedance with frequency. So how about the classic carbon composition resistor? How do they perform? Let's examine the Allen Bradley datasheet from 1990. They were the dominant player in carbon comps for decades. And here's their published data for their one watt size. And right away we see something interesting. There is no portion of this plot where the impedance ratio ever increases above one. That means these resistors don't experience parasitic inductance, at least up to 100 MHz. And that's their well-known behavior and the kernel of truth in the lore about carbon comp resistors. Notice, however, that they do have a parasitic capacitive response. It starts to be noticeable at around 1K and becomes especially pronounced over 10K. At 100K, for example, the impedance ratio has dropped to 0.4 at 10 MHz. Zooming out a bit to look at the full page, we see plots for resistor sizes from an eighth watt up to two watts. The key takeaway here is, as the resistor physical size increases, so does its parasitic capacitive reactance at any given frequency. So there's something about the physical size of the resistor that drives that phenomenon. Let's look now at how metal film resistors perform. They're commonly suggested as a replacement for carbon comps. The Vichet PR01 is a popular one watt size. 
and here's Vachet's plotted data. Notice right away a big difference as compared to the Allen Bradley data. These do have parasitic inductance at low resistance values. It's especially pronounced at 1 ohm. Its impedance ratio increases to 6 to 1 at 100 MHz. As the resistor value increases, the parasitics switch from inductive to capacitive. For higher resistance values, we see a similar effect as with the Allen Bradley carbon comps. And just like with the AB carbon comps, larger wattage metal films also have larger parasitic responses at any given frequency. In this case, both the inductive and the capacitive responses increase with increasing package size. I'm such a nerd about this subject that I actually took both 1 watt data sheets and replotted them on the same scale. And here's what that looks like. The blue curves are Vachet and the green curves are Allen Bradley. The Vachet actually has less capacitive behavior than the ABs at higher resistance values. Around 10k ohms, it's kind of a push, and of course the AB outperforms Vachet at low ohms. For kicks, I also put in plots for RCD CF25 carbon film series. Those are the orange curves. They perform the best of the three. There's barely any change in impedance ratio from 10 ohms to 100k ohms up to 100 megahertz. Now their data is for a quarter watt size, so larger sizes are likely to be worse, but I couldn't find any data other than for this one quarter watt size. Of course, there's a lot of assumptions buried here in this comparison, not the least of which is lead length. AB states that they kept them to a quarter of an inch to minimize the effect of the lead inductance. And certainly a host of other test parameters between the three manufacturers might be different. But at a minimum, this comparison gives us directional insight as to the parasitic effects. Okay, a quick segue here. What about thin film surface mount resistors? They're of course much smaller than through-hole resistors, so do they avoid these effects? According to Vachet's technical notes, the impedance ratio is unaffected for frequencies up to about a gigahertz. So no concern down here in the 100 megahertz and below region. Now the geometry of your board traces might have an effect though. So it seems the Vachet PR01 metal films can be used as a drop-in replacement for the 1 watt or smaller Allen Bradley carbon comps, at least for resistor values of 100 ohms or higher. But for values below that, you really need to look at the effect of that parasitic inductance on your circuit. And for both the AB carbon comps and the Vachet metal films, the capacitive reactance increases as the wattage or package size increases. So that's important to be aware of before just arbitrarily substituting a higher wattage resistor in a circuit, especially if it's a sensitive RF circuit. For my DX60 project, I was able to find new old stock carbon comps for most of the replacements, but there were a few lower values that I replaced with those PR01 metal films, but only after I looked at their function in the circuit and verified that the parasitic inductance would not be a problem. Where does this parasitic inductance and capacitance come from? Let's take a very simplified look at how an axial lead resistor is constructed. Inside the familiar cylindrical body, we will find two electrodes attached to the two leads, and between the electrodes will be a slug of resistive material. In the case of carbon composition resistors, that slug is a composite of carbon, ceramic, and a binder. For metal film and carbon film resistors, the slug is typically a ceramic pellet with either the metal film or the carbon film applied to its outside surface. The leads themselves have a tiny bit of resistance, but we can usually safely ignore that. They'll also have some inductance just because they're conductors. Now whether or not we can safely ignore that depends on how long the leads are and the operating frequency. For example, an inch-long 40,000th diameter lead has an inductance of around 20 nanohenries. Trimming that lead to a quarter of an inch drops it to 3 nanohenries. Back to the slug. Now depending on how it's constructed, it might also have parasitic inductance. Carbon comp slugs don't because they're a homogeneous mass. However, metal film and carbon film slugs can have a parasitic inductance if the film is trimmed in a helical pattern to reach the design value. The shape of the trimming, or if it's even trimmed at all, depends on the manufacturer's process for hitting the design resistance value and the tolerance. But regardless of how the slug is constructed, it will have parasitic capacitance. There's just no way to avoid it. The reason is simple. We've got two electrodes spaced a distance apart, and in and around that gap we have a mix of partially conductive and insulative materials. 
Those materials have dielectric properties, which means they can store electric charge, which makes the combination a capacitor. Here's a very commonly used simple model for simulating these effects. We engineers call this type of model a lumped element model, which means we're approximating the complexity of the real situation by using fixed values, or lumps if you will, of resistors, capacitors, and inductors. This makes analysis easier, yet gives results that are still useful for predicting actual behavior. The most obvious lump in this model is right here, R sub B, the body resistance. That, of course, is the specified value of our resistor. But notice this inductor in series with it called L sub B, and this capacitor in parallel with both of them called C sub B. These are the inductive and capacitive parasitics I've been talking about, and they tend to act in this series parallel combination. Each lead will also have a bit of resistance, shown as R sub L, and some inductance, shown as L sub L. And as I mentioned earlier, R sub L will be very small for most resistors, just a few milliohms, so we can typically ignore it without worry. L sub L, however, might be important, again, depending on the lead length and circuit frequencies. So, what insights can we take from this model? First off, if R sub B were just a few ohms, then the impedance will be vulnerable to any appreciable inductive reactance. Let's say that L sub B is 10 nanohenries. Now that's not an unreasonable value, given that I said earlier that an inch long lead is around 20 nanohenries. Putting 1 ohm for R sub B and 10 nanohenries for L sub B in our model yields this response curve. It doesn't exactly match the PR01 curve, but it still shows how very sensitive low resistance values are to even a small amount of parasitic inductance. Let's reset the model now for an R sub B of 100k ohms. And let's choose 2 tenths of a picofarad, or 200 femtofarads if you will, for C sub B. That's not an unrealistic value for the body capacitance. And look, this model predicts behavior that is directionally aligned with the AB and the Vichet responses, even if it isn't exact. We can also observe how insensitive the model is to parasitic inductance for larger resistances like 100K. That makes sense because the magnitude of the inductive reactance is just too small to affect R sub B. And similarly, for low resistance values, the model is insensitive to parasitic capacitance. We've already got a very low value for R sub B, and paralleling it with a significantly larger capacitive reactance doesn't change the impedance. The final thing I want to briefly cover in this episode are a few other options for replacing low value carbon comps. Ceramic composition is a good choice because it's also inherently non inductive. Ohmite in particular makes several models, including their 1 watt OX series, and those are available in values as low as 3.3 ohms. But be prepared to dig deeper into your wallet, though. Those ceramic comps retail between $1 to $3 a piece. Now that's about five times the cost of your typical 1 watt metal film. And just last year, RCD introduced their new CM series of carbon matrix resistors. They promise backward compatibility with Allen Bradley carbon comps, including having low inductance properties. However, I wasn't able to find a stocking distributor that carries them and sells them in small quantities. That's it for this episode, but I am planning on doing one more episode where I collect some data on these resistors and see if I can replicate those performance curves. I've got a stack of resistors to play with. I made a couple of fixtures here so I can test uh, the parts in series mode and the lower value ones in shunt mode on my Nano VNA, and we'll see what that looks like. I do hope you found this material interesting, and I do hope you are enjoying my channel. So until next time, bye for now.